C'est parti. Bonjour à tous, ceux qui nous retrouvaient sur Zoom et à ceux qui nous suivent également en live sur Facebook pour ce, cette première masterclass de notre premier invité d'honneur, M. Stephen Trish, que nous sommes absolument ravis d'accueillir aujourd'hui sur le festival. C'est une masterclass qui va durer environ entre 30 et 40 minutes et qui sera modérée par Perrine Kenesson, qui est une journaliste qui travaille sur plusieurs supports comme le film français, Paris Première ou encore Cinématiseur. Euh, la masterclass est en anglais. En revanche, vous pourrez évidemment la retrouver en replay limité avec les sous-titres dans quelques jours. Voilà, je ne prends pas trop de, de temps sur ce, ce bel événement. Je vous souhaite à tous évidemment de, de profiter de ce grand monsieur et de passer un excellent festival. Merci à tous et à très bientôt. Merci Sophie. So, um, bonjour tout le monde. Hi everybody uh, and especially hi Steven. Hello. Um, we are so happy to have you with us. Uh, I'm, sorry, I I'm sorry I don't speak French. <laughs> well, that's fine. That's, that's fine. So um, I'm going to ask the first question, which is very a very legitimate question to ask right now. How are you? I'm very, very well. I walk twice a day. That's all I do is I take exercise. I'm very, very well. I have no virus. Um, no, I'm ridiculously well. Frustrated, oh, that's, that's, going mad. That's great. So how um, London is not in London any, anymore? You're not confined, totally confined anymore. But how was the confinement for you? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, there are things I can't do, or I can't see people. I can't go to restaurants, but. Um, I can go for walks. I walk. I go for walks with friends. That's all I do. I talk and read. It's, it's the extent of my life. It's Can't not too boring. It's not too boring for you. It, well, it's not, often it's very, very boring. Uh, um, yes, it's anyway. It's, it's life. And so, was it a very creative uh, time for you? Did you use this time to work on a new project, or was it inspiring for you in any way? Well, I was about to shoot something in New York, and, I, and we were stopped three days before we started shooting. So when it all finishes, I guess I'll go back and do that. And then I'm making a film next year in England, and I've been working on that. So you used this time, but... Do you feel like you would use this, I don't know, uh, confinement time to maybe create a story or I don't know? Uh, do you no, think I, it, it could be a very... First of all, I don't create stories. I no. make films. Um, so I'm not like that. But no, no, no. I just, I mean, I'm sure talking to people is very good for you. And I walk around thinking a lot. So um, you are here for the ninth uh, edition of the Champs-Élysées Film Festival. So it's an online edition because of the pandemic situation. Yeah. So um, cinemas are still closed in France. Uh, I think it's the same in England. Um, but movies always find a way to uh, reach people and to be shown. So uh, that's the point of this festival. So was it important for you to be here to uh, support cinema, movies and festivals in any shape they can take? Well, I just support them all the time. I mean, I'd rather be with you than talking to you like this, but that's life. Yeah. So how will you show films on TV? On t no, on the, on the internet. The yeah. people they are they are just uh, going like there is like a yeah. cinema. There is a, just a specific uh, time, and they can watch movies. So it's a brand new way to adapt to this situation. And they're, and they're films made by young people, new people, new people. Exactly, they're made by, oh, by new people. Yeah, actually, it's, the, it's an independent film festival. It's about independence in cinema. So um, what, what does it mean for you, uh, independent, to be independent in, in movies? Well, I know what it's like to work for the studio system. Anything that isn't in the studio system is independent. So I learned, that, you know, I learned the hard way how difficult it was to work in the studios. So I, you know, I prefer, I mean, I make films with my friends, so I prefer independent films. And what does it mean independent for you? It means like not being with a studio, it just being doing with it's a little that, money. The real, it's when you make films with the studios, they're very, very, I mean, they're full of very brilliant people who know what they want 
I'm not sure they wanted films that people like me make. I mean, they're, they're very slick operations. Quite what different you, from making an independent film. What do you mean they, they don't want films like you? Well, make? They're, they're big, complicated organizations which want to make money. And their principal thing, whereas you, you might find that I wanted to make a good film. <laughs> So there's a sort of conflict right from the beginning. But the I was always treated very well. I'm not really complaining. But it was very, very different. I mean, I made American films and I made studio films and studio films were always, were always different. Yeah, we'll come back to this uh, yeah. topic later, actually. But I, I wanted to start with your uh, beginning of career because you started at, um, as a TV director with the, the BBC mostly. Uh, and then yeah. you moved on to cinema, and now you're back on TV, uh, mainly. So, uh, yeah, why, but why not, did you... uh, the truth is, I went where the material was good, and the material always led me into certain situations. So, recently, I've done this work in TV because the, the what I was asked to do was very, very good. It's really as simple as that. And next year, I'll do a film. I mean the. The cinema is under threat and it's tough. So I keep saying to them, why don't you make this film for television? No, 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 we want to make it for the cinema. So I'll go along with that. I remember with The Queen, which was a very successful film, saying, well, why are we not making this for television? So I know very, very little. But um, why, why, why do you say our cinema is under threat? Well, in my country, the audiences like a certain kind of American film. They like American films, but they don't like British. Nobody's interested in British films. So you're, you're fighting a difficult battle from the beginning. And I, I'm thinking... Uh, I mean, in, Korea, France, like in France, it always, it always seemed very different in France, that, that French audiences were interested in French films. But in England, they're not interested in English films. And... Actually, I was thinking about uh, other directors from your generation, like Mike Lee or Ken Lodge. They also started uh, on TV, like yeah, you, yeah. and uh, then they moved on to, to cinema, like you. So uh, do you think like a new, a young director could exactly do the same path, or is it harder to get in TV now? Well, I don't know enough about it. I, I don't know. It's really... I mean, both Ken and Mike and I, we've all had long careers. And that's what's probably been the best thing for us. And we grew up, we were very, very well educated in, you know, you learnt good values in British television. And that's why we've sort of lasted so long. I don't know, mm -hmm. I, I would think it's very difficult for young people now. Or maybe it's, it's easy to get your first film, but harder to get your second film. Yes, I think so. And even TV is even more elitist now. Everybody's like the new Eldorado. Everybody wants to do TV now. Well, it's where the money is. So, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of money there. So if you want, I don't know. I've twice in the last three years had very, very good material. And it was a pleasure to work. And, you know, they're all my friends. So I had a really nice time. And uh, actually the, the new Eldorado as well is the platform like Netflix or Amazon. I don't, I, I, I don't really understand them. I mean, I, both the miniseries I've done were paid for by American broadcasters. So I, but I don't know, I've never known that I was doing a film for Netflix. Wait, Amazon made, made one of the things, but they kept away. I mean, I can, you know, I, I can see how difficult it is. But if you make a good film like Roma, you're all right. I've always just believed that good film. If you make good films, you'll be okay. But it's a very naive thing to think. It's a naive thing to think what? That if you make good films, God will somehow protect you. <laughs> if a film is good, people will want to see it. But that's because I grew up in the 60s when people were like them. Oh, wait, do you think uh, the time has changed that much? Nobody wants to see just good movies. They just want to see movies. Well, I know that. I know that, for example, in England, they now hardly show French films. When I grew up, there were French films opening the whole time. So if I want to see a French film, I, I, you know, they, won't, they don't show them anymore because the audience has got so small. So it's harder. 
And why do you think people are less curious? I dread to, th I have no idea because they've all been seduced by the Americans and young <laughs> people aren't interested in it anymore. Whereas my generation was interested in the cinema. I don't think, you know, I learned to live my life through the cinema and um, I don't think they do anymore. They just want to watch cartoon movies, don't they? Superman and whatever it is. And about good movies, actually, uh, for you, I think like a good movie is first a good script a good scenario it's always, well, it's always a good script yes no it's always a good but i mean i like films about human beings and i can see they're less fashionable than they were but when i was young there were all these french directors making wonderful films you know truffaut and uh, um louis mal and people like that so it was a wonderful it was if you were interested in the kind of films i'm interested in it was a very good time to be young so you you are that's what um, you grew up with this kind of cinema, French cinema, is that something that inspired yes. you? Yeah, yeah. I remember when I first saw Abu Souf and um, Truffaut films, yeah. And and you could see the whole uh, European cinema was opening up. So when I was young, young man, you could see, you know, all these European masterpieces. And so about scripts, because I, uh, how do you pick up a story? Because you received a lot of scripts. Uh, oh, you are, I'm, you are not I'm like a I just I sit here and people send me scripts, and I read one and think, oh, that's fantastic. I am the opposite of. I think I'm the. Uh, well, it really depends if you how you interpret what an auteur is. In the purest <laughs> sense, I'm everything an auteur should be. But I don't um, write films, or I don't write my own films. I just read scripts and like them. And if, if I like them, I tend to make them. And how, what is a good script and what is a bad script? Uh, a good script you? is one I like. But if you ask me to be more, well, it will, you know, it'll have a good story. It'll be articulate. It'll be well written. Good, good characters. Like a good play. Well, like you said, you're not writing yourself. So uh, how is your relationship with the writers? Do you, well, are you involved in the, in the writing? Well, I'm involved after a certain, they come to me with scripts. So when they come, they say, look, this script is about so-and-so. And then if I find the idea interesting, then I go on from there. And then I'll say, well, I don't think this bit is very good or whatever it is. And so you then work on it. But the, the subject matter has been sort of determined before I read it. And uh, I understood that for My Beautiful Landret, uh, which is one of your first, um, movies and which really put you on the map for the cinema lovers, really. Um, you were very involved uh, in the writing with uh, Anis Kureishi. Uh, so well, uh, how, how was the collaboration with him? Not really. No, he turned up with... I uh, know I was much more ignorant than that. He turned up with his script and I said, this is very, very good. So, you know, well done me. Um, and then we... I did some. I did. I did some work on the script, but if I remember rightly, it made it worse. So we went back to the original version. He, almost what we filmed was what he gave me. And what did this this movie represent to you? Because it's such a very uh, angular stone, a very big stone in your career. So what does it represent to you? Well, it changed all our lives. It changed Hanif's life. It changed Dan Day Lewis's life. It changed my life. It changed all our lives. You know, it was completely. You know, so it was, it was everything you would dream of. Um, but it was more interesting than that because it was a, you know, I was brought up like a white imperialist and suddenly someone came and explained to me about the politics of all that. So I became political. He's, he, he really educated me. And you think since this movie, your, your movies went more political after that? All your movies? Well, I don't know, but my mind went more political. I became more political, or I became more informed about politics. You know, if you ask me about all these statues being pulled down, I know all about that. But when I read the script of the laundrette, I wouldn't have known any of that stuff and what they were complaining about. And I'm, I mean, I'm sh the truth is I'm shocked by my education, which was very conventional, very, very, very conventional really just the history of the British Empire. Now I've discovered there's another side to it. So 
you know, I go on being educated. Yeah, so that's very interesting. That's very uh, what's happening right now. It's the yeah. matter of educating people, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. Education is always a large part of why I make films to learn about things and to learn also about uh, real life stories. Because since a few years now, for a few years now, sorry, uh, you seem to mainly tell stories yes. inspired by true events. It's uh, true, and I can see yeah. that. I can see that real life has become sort of more interesting. Right. I mean, if you had a film that was with Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant, I don't quite know <laughs> how you do it nowadays, but um, real life has become, I mean, you know, what's going on at the moment in, in Britain is, it's never happened before. So it is very, very interesting, however infuriating. Yes, of course, but uh, what, why do you, because you, there are real life stories, there are documentaries about real life stories. So why do you feel like you have to fictionalize those? those I can't answer your question. I just, I just noticed that that's what's happened. That's what, I yeah. mean, if you came to me with uh, Lilia Zondorgerose now, I mean, it was always a wonderful script and a wonderful story. I don't know, people have stopped coming to me with scripts as good as that. The good, the interesting scripts are now about, you know, politics and the real world. But why it's happened, I don't know. And if you ask Pathé, they'll say, if you say at the beginning, this is a true story, the audience are immediately interested. And you also, because you choose, you pick those stories, so you are interested yeah. also because of mm -hmm. real life stories. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it um, happened quite slowly. I mean, uh, before we made The Queen, I made another film about Tony Blair. And I remember when the script came in and I said, this is the most interesting thing I've read about Britain for years. Or like the laundrette. Well, the laundrette was, that was fiction. But um, the, the f first film about Blair was, you know, an account of his, of how he became leader of the Labour Party. And it was very, very interesting. So, you know, I was seduced by the writers. Still, this relationship with the writers that's very interesting you are very, My friends seem very are the writers. Uh, yeah but you seem very humble to them you, you are like a huge well, director it's, it's, and you seem very humble to the writers it's the bit i can't do i can't i don't know how they do it i once sat with christopher hansen on a script i couldn't understand why he said well let's go from that scene to that scene you say well why he said well i don't know but i d i don't i mean i'm just simply not a writer and have the grace not to pretend to be one. But you're a great narrator. You know how to narrate the stories. Well, the, the films have a narrative and I've, I may have learned how to improve it or do it gracefully or something. And you said in an interview that uh, oh, you God. tell your, your, your students who want to learn about movies that they should know about economics, not tracking shots. So uh, it, did you learn that from working on TV, this, this very this importance of economics, of budget, of things like that. This is something that you learn there. You know, if you make the films I make, you don't get a lot of money. So you have to learn how to spend it wisely. So, you know, and I have producers who I trust and they're spending the money sensibly. So you, you know the price of everything. So I remember so saying, I'm not sure I still agree with it, but, um, that was my next question. <laughs> Do you still agree with that? <laughs> well, I, 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 curious enough, I wish I'd studied economics at school. I mean, that's what I would like to know about. I don't understand economics, but I would like to. But do you think you can be more creative with like a tight budget than with a lot, a lot of money? Do you think that we, we get more well, creative everyone, with that? Uh, Hugh Grant in some documentary said I was much better when I didn't have very much money. I mean, that was one of the things with Hollywood. The money was so enormous. You know, I had huge budgets and it was very frightening. You know, I know that, you know, if I make a film, these people may go and see it. In Hollywood, they know that millions of people have to go and see it. So I was rather intimidated by the money. I found it rather frightening. So I never knew how to spend these vast sums of money. Other people have no trouble with it, but I did. So I was better. But what I also discovered was that you know, I was quick on my feet and really my films, it's all to do with the intelligence of me and the actors and the writer. 
And if and you're I, intelligent and witty and that you can keep going. And actually I would talk about this this part of your career in the United States because you went there, you came back to UK and and, yeah. and vice versa. And uh, so you said you were frightened by all the money and working I with studios. Thought when I went to America, the first film I made in America was produced by Scorsese and that was fine. I thought I would be a very good studio director. Why? You know, I thought, well, I, I love the, I love the big stars we had in the years on Dangereux. And I thought, oh, I can direct them. But in fact, I could, I, I couldn't, you know, it's like making a film in a circus. You have to have, you have to understand different bits. And I don't understand that. So what did you learn in the United States? Even if it's a good thing or a bad not thing, make, what did you not learn? To make studio, not to make studio films. Okay. I, I mean, in fact, the last film, last studio film, High, High Fidelity, I remember the head of the studio ringing me up and saying, <clears throat> make this like an independent film. And I thought, oh, well, that's a very generous thing to say. But you learn, in fact, what I learned in the studio system was that I was quite independent. And I hadn't realized that before. I thought I'd be very good. Very, I thought I could be like Sidney Pollock. I'd be very good at making those sort of films with big stars. I was hopeless. <laughs> and you, you were talking about uh, Dangerous Liaison. Uh, so what this movie, because it's such a... Uh, My Beautiful Landred put you on the map for the cinema lovers, but uh, Dangerous Liaison uh, made you a huge star well, director. It was a much bigger film than I'd ever made. And, what um, do you? What did it represent to you? What did, do you recall of this experience? It was a very, it was wonderful. It was very, very enjoyable. It was very, and I, well, I loved filming in Paris. And as you walk through the streets, you would think, oh, I'm going to run into Audrey Hepburn. Cary Grant is going to come around. It was a wonderful experience. And the script was very, very good. And the actors became very, very good. John Malkovich and Glenn Close and Michelle. And it was just a joy. It was so funny. And uh, I remember the producers would go off to see the rushes every day, two women. They would come back sort of clutching themselves. They were so excited by what they were seeing. So it was a, you know, if you have a script that good, you're going to be all right. And a cast that good. Did it change something in your career? Sorry? You? Did it change something oh, in your career? Yeah, it changed everything, yeah. Mm. I'm not an idiot. I can see that. Mm. <laughs> So, and you were talking about casting that, that is very prominent in your work, uh, yes. the casting, you know, or, because there is two parts of it. Like you, are, you like working with huge stars, huge actors that are already well-known, and also you help um, put on the map some other actors, like yeah. uh, Daniel Deleuze in My Beautiful yeah. Andre, Tim Roth in The Heat, or Gary Oldman in Pick Up Your Ears. Uh, yeah. they, they, were, they were not the, the stars they are now. So, well, I didn't um, have a lot of money, so I had to have new people. <laughs> You know, but I but I, I remember Liaison was a very glamorous film, so I had these big stars. And it always reminded me of a Hitchcock film, of a Hollywood film. I never thought of it as an independent film. In fact, I wanted to get away from making it like an independent, like a sort of European art film. I wanted it to be glamorous and glossy, quite deliberately. You sort so how of, do you, sorry. You, you, you work out what kind of film you're supposed to be making. John Gielgud said, if you're lucky, you know what film you're in. So you, <laughs> try to, you try to understand what film you're doing. And it always takes a certain amount of time. But how did you make your career, actually? Because it's, I, I will come back to that later, because it's a, like a whole I, new... I don't know place. how I've made it. I mean, I've, the truth is, I've just done whatever I found interesting. And I've been very lucky. People send me scripts. Oh, that's interesting. All right, I'll do that. And for some reason, it's all added up. But I never had any more ambition. So I've had yeah, a career you... of lack of ambition. <laughs> well, you're a lucky one. <laughs> so uh, I am very, very lucky. But uh, to, to come back to the, to the cast, casting thing, uh, how do you choose your actors? What, what drives you to the actors? Because they have such amazing performances in your movies. They even win prizes for it. Like, I mean, Ellen Mirren or yeah. even uh, Ben Wishow for a uh, very English scandal. Uh -huh. so, well, you know, all an actor wants to do is to be cast well. Once you cast, actor, you cast an actor well, 
so that you're making a film about what's in front, not, you're not making a sort of abstract film, you're making a film about this person, this character in front of you, played by Glenn Close or Dustin Hoffman or, or whoever, that's sort of the end of it. And if they're happy, it's easy. If they're unhappy, it's a nightmare. I mean, I've, there have been films where people were unhappy and then it's horrible because they sort of know they're, they shouldn't be there and you've just made a mistake. And it's, it's always my fault. Which one? No, I'm not going to tell you. No, I tried. I tried. Um, yeah, but uh, also with the um, with movies like The Queen or Tamara Drew or Philomena or even Florence Foster Jenkins, you showcase really complex, interesting, strong female characters, no. young and older. Uh, so, um, and that's actually, it was also there in Dangerous Liaison and and Mary Rayleigh. Um, but it's even more effective those last twenty years. Yes. So is that a is that a conscious choice to have those strong? No, I just grew things? older. <laughs> that's, that's not conscious. I just grew older, and or I don't know. I cu I couldn't explain that, but I can see it's been the last twenty years have been very good. But yeah, I don't. The, the, know those, those feminine, uh, those very female female characters they are very very interesting. So yes. it's uh, it's kind of it, and it's nice to see also like older actresses having great roles like this, so uh, it was... Well, I learned that. I, Joseph, when I made My Beautiful Laundrette, and th there was a run of films around that time, My Beautiful Laundrette, Prick Up Your Ears, The Grifters, Dangerous Liaisons, and they were always about um, what you French people would call the marginals, um, homosexuals, women, and you realize that they were the they were all rather subversive characters transgressive characters and that was what was interesting and that in a way conventional men were rather less interesting i always admired i admired the actresses they knew why they were there they come to work they knew their lines they did everything you you know they were great it was always the men who were more tortured and more you know neurotic the women were very, very impressive. So I was lucky in that um, I was I was brought up to have a view of women, which was which turned out to be very good. I was lucky in the women I chose. You know, Angelica Houston is magnificent. Annette is magnificent. And uh, actually, I wanted to come back to this to how to define Stephen Freer's style. It's really hard. You're you're you're, you're, you're so think... diverse. I don't think about it. This is a story. I have to tell this story. How do I tell it? This is what comes out. I don't worry about it. You're too French. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm too Because I don't think of myself as an auteur. I don't worry about these things. So how do you see yourself? How do I? See yourself, if you don't see yourself as an auteur. I don't know. I'm just a... F I mean, I go to work like John Ford. <laughs> I go to work and, you know, I have, you know, I have children's support and houses and women, wives and things like that. So I don't really worry about it. I think I'm very, very lucky. I don't ask more questions than that. And I think that I always had a very good eye for material and I had a very good instinct for actors. And I, when I stick to those things, I'm all right. When I've done other things, I've got into trouble. <laughs> what does it mean, uh, other things? Well, when I took myself too seriously, or there's a, I was just been reading Woody Allen's book, and he tried to make a different kind of film, films like Interiors. He tried, he tried consciously, oh, I'll make this film. I want to be Chekhov. And then he realized that all he could really do was tell jokes. <laughs> and um, you, you get distracted by things and you, you go off down byways. So perhaps you acquire a certain amount of self-knowledge. I always used to tell students, don't worry, you'll grow up. You can't stop yourself from growing up. You'll grow up and everything will be clearer. <laughs> and all I ever talk about on the set is clarity. Is this clear? Is what I'm saying clear? So that's the main thing. And do you think you grew up and now everything is clear? I think it, I think I got a lot clearer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's just growing older. 
but I can easily get muddled. <laughs> it's not very difficult to get muddled, to get myself into a mess. And actually, what are your next projects? You talked about it at the beginning of the... Of well, the I was about to do an American TV job. And it uh, got the, the, stopped. Dr. Death. Dr. Death. Yeah. And it got stopped. And then I'm supposed to make, which I think I will, my, my hope is that I'll finish it. I'll do it in October. And then next year, I'm supposed to make a film in England with Steve Coogan. And, and Sally the movie in England is it about this woman who found the, the, who found the body of the Richard III under a car park. Mm. So it's already eccentric. This is a great story. Actually, that's it's, a great story. It's a very, very peculiar story. Mm. Mm. And it's in Leicester. That's where you come from. I come from Leicester, yes. No, no, it's, 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 that's all. It, anyway, at the same time, it's a ridiculous story, but it actually deals in rather large themes, like, you know, Richard III was the last British king to be killed on the battlefield. Oh, oh so it means it was a battlefield. Oh, it was a battle. Richard III died in battle, yeah. So it, it, deal, it deals with large films and it's also with a strong sense of the ridiculous. Everything I like. And how do you uh, define the, 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 between your movies? Because they are very diverse, the subjects are very diverse. Uh, but also we can feel like there is a, a kind of continuity in your, they are very uh, witty, they are very, uh, uh, there's a lot of deadpan in it, and also it's very emotional. So yeah. uh, is that something you are... Uh, no, that sounds like me. You? Yeah, that sounds like me. This is the... Your, no, your, I, don't your, think, I don't really, I mean, it's nice when you say that, and I think, oh, no, that's right, but um, if I started thinking about that, it would be bad. Definitely, I think so. You would do it consciously, that would be terrible. So, yes, I prefer innocence. So um, now I'm, I'm going to ask some questions uh, from the internet. People from the internet ask, ask right. some questions for you. So uh, I'm, I will give their names and then ask the question. Mm. So uh, the first question is from Laurence Moreau. Uh, her question is, what does inspire you? What does drive, your, um, what does drive you to make a movie? Well, I get very interested in stories and in the storytelling, you know, and I'd, I'd like to do that as well as possible. And I'd like to interest the audience and things like that. So that's the sort of, that's always going on. And you find bits of life in, the, in these very odd places, you know. I didn't, when I made Philomena, I didn't know about all this terrible stuff with Irish. Catholicism. You know, you, f you find, I suppose I have a lot of curiosity and these things catch your attention and then that's all you need. Yeah, you're inter interested in uh, the human uh, things and the yeah. complexity of humans, actually. Of course, of course. And also I have a question from Caroline Levesque. Um, do you, you already, already, already a little answered to this question, but still, do you consider yourself as an independent director? As a what? Independent director. As do a what director? Yourself? Independent. Independent? Yes. Yes. Yeah, though my money mainly comes from Pathé, so does that make me independent or dependent? <laughs> Pathé tends to support me and have been very good to me. But I can see the films that I make are eccentric and they're not, you know, they're not cartoon films or whatever generally gets made. If I made cartoon films, I'd be a lot richer. <laughs> Maybe that's the next step. You can do oh, a no, 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 no. <laughs> the truth is they're cleverer than that. Don't get him. Don't get him. No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, so Laurence Raymond is asking, um, that's a very a personal question actually, uh, what did you cook the most during confinement or what was the meal you enjoyed eating the most? Last night I bought a pizza. Mm. We've been eating roast beef, lamb. Tonight I think we're having pasta. I mean, it's, it's no different from anybody else. 
but I, live with, I live with a woman who writes about food. Oh, nice. So, so I'm well are... looked after. But is there like a, a special meal or a special thing no. that you like the most? No. no. no? no. Well, I would like to go to a restaurant. Oh, yeah, I understand that. Me too. Uh, but that that yeah. So you like your food like you like your movies, diverse. That's yes, it. of course. Well, and diverse and probably very English. <laughs> very English. Oh yeah, yes. rough this maybe. <laughs> well, like my mother used to cook. I imagine I drive whoever's cooking for me mad. What kind of food did she cook? Well, it was the war, so there wasn't very much food. <laughs> it was very, very... Um, I was born during the war, so there was terrible food. I mean, the food wasn't very good. Rationing. So, yeah, ration, yeah. Mm. So now you enjoy a good meal. That's yes. right. Mm. Um, Axel Biglet uh, asks you, are you like Rob Gordon, stressed at the idea of making your all-time top five? No, it's a very, very modern thing. That it's very, it, it wasn't my generation. For some reason, I was talking to Nick Hornby about it recently. That's not what we were like. In my lifetime, when I was young, the pop culture arrived. It didn't really exist then and it slowly in my life appeared so the idea of there being a choice of five things i mean i wouldn't it it, it isn't just isn't how my generation thought but now do you have like a no i'm very point? very old <laughs> if you ask me what my favorite film is i would say something and then i five minutes later I'd say no 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 it was terrible i'd like i don't have to think like that i'm a child of the computer i can like many many things and uh, recently, like actually, like recent in recent cinema, is, is there some movie that really you uh, struck you that you really like? Is there some movie you really like recently? You so? Well, I've so not seen a film for so long that I can't remember any. I can't remember a single film. Tell me a or film. Or even scary. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> not hard. Uh, something. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, did you see Bong Juno's movie, The Paradise? Yeah, oh, I like that. That was very good. I, I thought that was very good, yes. No, I like that very much. Very much. And I think there was one other American film I liked. But it's, I've forgotten him. Sorry, you are dealing with a very, very old man. I mean, that's not that. We all forget. Don't ask me what I watched yesterday. I don't remember. No, so, no. Uh, yeah, don't worry. But I did, like, I did like the Korean film very much. I love the woman coming to the door and saying, I've left something downstairs. <laughs> I thought that was very, very funny. It's a very, very funny and very yeah. uh, complex. I can't remember movie. any other film I've seen ever. <laughs> uh, and, and not even the, like a series or documentary recently? Nothing? That's really oh, the documentaries, documentaries are fantastic. Doc I mean, the documentaries... I mean, I don't know how you make documents, but I can see they're brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Do you watch them like on Netflix or things like that? I haven't got Netflix. You haven't got Netflix, so yeah, resistance. Nice. Uh, <laughs> there's another question about, uh, from uh, Lulia and Nath. Um, among all your movies, what is your favorite one? Do you have a favorite movie? It's like picking, choosing from your children, but do you have a favorite movie? Once I was in Paris and I was taken to a reception at the Elysee Palace and they took me up to meet Francois Mitterrand and um, I was taken up and they said, this is Stephen Frears who made Lily as en dangereuse. And he turned to me and said, yes, but I preferred the little Irish film you made, which is a film called The Snapper which I loved. I, he was so, I couldn't believe that anyone could say something so brilliant. And I looked to see if someone was whispering in his ear, but there wasn't. He'd been, you know, he used to show a film every night. I love this Irish film, The Snapper. Wonderful. And that taught me about, I didn't know anything about Irish families. <clears throat> you know, I'm a wicked Englishman. We killed them all. Um, I love The Snapper. It was so funny and so heartbreaking. And it taught me so much about family life. 
And it's very interesting how you learn throughout your movie. That's very interesting. Well, you're learning. If you're lucky, you learn. If you're stupid, you don't learn. We have a prime <laughs> minister who doesn't learn. Oh, the prime minister point now. <laughs> We're just, uh, yeah, you are kind of angry at this administration, I see. Well, it's just dreadful, really. I mean, you know, this whole business about children and their education is just appalling. And this number of people who've died, absolutely disgraceful. Sorry, I'll shut yeah. up. No, 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 it's fine, fine. Just, just think it's just for a little amount of time and then you will move on. You mm. will move on. The country will move on. I hope um, so. I hope for you. So I have um, a last question from Clementine Locatelli. Uh, it's about my beautiful laundress. So it dealt with strong and unfiltered subjects uh, during uh, Saturian England. So uh, how did you manage to finance and make this film? Because it seems like very tricky at the time. And we made it very, very cheap. I mean, really cheap. At that time, there was a company which was quite new <coughs> called My Beautiful Laundrette, called uh, Channel 4. And um, it just sort of happened. Films are often quite magical. Liaison and Dondre shouldn't have been made, but it just so happened that, you know, there was a film company in California, there was this, there was that. And suddenly this film got made, but it was a it was contrary to all logic for either film to be made. Well, it was television money that made the Dondrette, but they were both sort of blessed in some way. And in fact, for a film, for these sort of films to do well, you have to be blessed. You have to have a fair wind. Um, they don't, otherwise they don't work. And I think that's a very interesting thought for the end of this uh, discussion. Do you think you have to be blessed a little to 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 I'm afraid you have do. A cinema. Yeah. You have a, have a nice theory above your cr cribble. <laughs> so yeah. you need you so, need the, the west wind behind you. The west wind. Not the, the west east wind. wind. The west wind is warm. The east wind is cold. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know enough in weather to you know that, but yeah. Well the the west wind is what you want. The good weather comes from the west. The I good weather and bad politics come from the West. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually very true. Now, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for this discussion. I was very happy to meet you. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you very much, and I hope you had a good time. Okay, and, uh, I hope I was all right. Thank you very much. And I hope we will see you uh, for real. Maybe, see you in uh, Paris. Next yeah. year in Paris. Yeah, I can't wait okay. to have a uh, glass of wine on Terrace with you. It'd be a pleasure. What happens now? <laughs>